Please be seated and I'm going to ask Peter to come and read from 2 Corinthians chapter 8, page 1163 in the Church Bible. Thank you, Peter. Morning. And now, brothers and sisters, we want you to know about the grace that God has given to the Macedonian churches. In the midst of a very severe trial, their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty welled up in rich generosity. For I testify that they gave as much as they were able and even beyond their ability. Entirely on their own, they urgently pleaded with us for the privilege of sharing in this service to the Lord's people. And they exceeded our expectations. They gave themselves first of all to the Lord and then by the will of God also to us. So we urged Titus, just as he had earlier made a beginning, to bring also completion to this act of grace on your part. But since you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in complete earnestness, and in the love we have kindled in you, see that you also excel in this grace of giving. I'm not commanding you, but I want to test the sincerity of your love by comparing it with the earnestness of others. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that, through his, so that you through his poverty might become rich. And here is my judgment about what is best for you in this matter. Last year you were the first not only to give, but also to have the desire to do so. Now finish the work, so that your eager willingness to do it may be matched by your completion of it according to your means. For if the willingness is there, the gift is acceptable according to what one has, not according to what one does not have. Our desire is not that others might be relieved while you are hard pressed, but that there might be equality. At the present time, your plenty will supply what they need, so that in turn, their plenty will supply what you need. The goal is equality. As it is written, the one who gathered much did not have too much, and the one who gathered little did not have too little. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. Please turn in your Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and to our text for this morning, which is verse 9 of that chapter. You know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you through his poverty might become rich. It's not uncommon to read in articles in the financial pages of newspapers about the subject of inheritance tax. It is a topic that to some degree is relevant to everyone who wants to transfer their wealth to a succeeding generation. This morning we are looking at what we might call the ultimate transfer of wealth. The Apostle Paul is writing to the church at Corinth on the subject of financial giving. He encourages their generosity. He desires to test the sincerity of their love for Christ and for fellow Christians. And he reminds them of the supreme example of giving. He reminds them of the indescribable gift of God's Son. And so it is in our text that he commences with the words, you know, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. The word grace means unmerited favor, a gift motivated entirely by love. As we come to the close of this Christmas time and to the commencement, God willing, of a new year, I want you to notice three aspects of the gift Jesus gives of himself the arrival of the Messiah, the coming of Christ. So firstly in our text, wealth, though he was rich. 
The first aspect to the coming of Christ is a reminder that Christ existed before Bethlehem. The Old Testament records appearances of the pre-incarnate Lord Jesus. That is, Jesus before he was born and laid in a manger. Isaiah says in Isaiah 6, I saw the Lord seated on a throne. In Daniel 3, we read in the fiery furnace with Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego, Nebuchadnezzar sees one who is like unto the Son of Man. Indeed, the Bible tells us that Christ existed before the creation of the world in which we live. For he is the creator. Through him, says John, all things were made. Without him, nothing was made that has been made. Indeed, the Bible tells us that Christ is the eternal God. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Indeed, Jesus speaks of himself in that high priestly prayer, as we call it, in John 17. He speaks of the glory he had with God the Father before the world began, though he was rich. How rich was Christ? Christ was rich in authority, seated on the throne of heaven. Christ was rich in glory and honour, high and lifted up. Christ was rich in worship and adoration. The angels cry, holy, 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 as they hide their faces from the Son of God. Christ was rich in the perfect fellowship and love within the triune Godhead, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And the Apostles' emphasis here on the richness of Christ is particularly significant because of its contrast with the poverty of mankind. We will sometimes say of two siblings that they are as different as chalk and cheese. In other words, they are in the same family, but in the greatest way possible, they are different. And this is indeed the greatest way possible. Chalk and cheese. We are poor. For we, though originally made in the image of God, that image has been marred. We are fallen and sinful. The perfect fellowship once enjoyed between man and God has been broken. A barrier of sin between man and God has been established. The very best we could ever offer God will now never ever be good enough to gain his acceptance and to gain entry into his heaven. The first Adam, the Adam of Genesis 3, man, mankind, is poor, absolutely poor, penniless, destitute. The total depravity of man is how the theologian would describe it. But Christ Christ, who is referred by the Apostle Paul in Romans 5 and 1 Corinthians 15 as the second Adam, is not like that. The contrast is as great as it could be. Where the first Adam is sinful, the second Adam is sinless. Where the first Adam is mortal, the second Adam is immortal. Where the first Adam is heading for hell, the second Adam resides in heaven, though he was rich. The first Adam, so poor. The second Adam, so wealthy. We begin with wealth, though he was rich. But I want you to notice that our text moves on, secondly, to poverty. Yet for your sake, he became poor. As we read these few words, here is the truth that we have celebrated again in recent days. 
Here is the great wonder of the incarnation. Here is the marvel of the birth of the babe of Bethlehem. The Apostle Paul, writing to the church at Philippi, puts it in this marvellous passage in Philippines 2. Speaking of Christ, he says, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. God became man. Surprise is an appropriate word at this time of year. It features often in the days of Christmas, the gift received that is so, such a wonderful surprise, so unexpected and yet so appropriate. Or the visitor who arrives unexpectedly, but we're pleased to see them, a wonderful surprise. Or perhaps it's the talent that is suddenly revealed watching all those cooking programs has paid dividends and suddenly the surprise of some culinary masterpiece as it's produced. And we think of Jesus, the Son of God, coming to earth 2,000 years ago. In one sense, there is no surprise. You see, for centuries, as recorded in the Old Testament, the promise of a Messiah, the coming of a Saviour, had been anticipated. They knew he would be born of the house of David. The birth of Jesus was simply the fulfilment of what had been foretold down through the centuries. We really need to grasp hold of the fact and use it in our evangelism that our God is a God who says and then does. The birth of Jesus should not have been a surprise to those who knew the Old Testament. 30 of the 39 Old Testament books are quoted in the New Testament. 10% of the New Testament consists of quotations or references from the Old Testament. In other words, again and again in the Gospels and the Epistles, the discovery is made that God said and then God fulfilled his word. But in another sense, there was and is real surprise. Do you remember what it was like when Prince George, the first uh, son of Kate and William, was born? Security surrounded the hospital. Policemen guarded the maternity ward. The world's media reported on the event. Paparazzi gathered, some perched precariously as they sought for a photo opportunity. Television interviews took place. Newspapers contained extensive articles. The social media, Facebook, Twitter and the like were buzzing. Every detail was noted down. The exact time of delivery, his weight, his height, the colour of hair, the colour of eyes, names and their significance, who was present at the birth, was he crying, was he sleeping, was he feeding, they asked. And the world's media craned their collective neck to catch the first glimpse of the royal baby. So here's the surprise. Do you remember the words of Isaiah that we read right at the beginning? For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders. And this babe will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Yet he was born in humble surroundings. He was placed in a manger. For the Christ child, there was no best hotel, no red carpet, no photographers, no police, no media. The world has been given no detail, no information on the exact time of delivery, no knowledge of his weight or his height or the colour of hair or the colour of eyes, nothing that this world is so interested in. He became poor, the Son of God, 
placed in a manger. What a surprise. Christ, who was rich, became poor. He who owns the cattle on a thousand hills, born in a cattle shed. He who owns the gold in every mine, receiving the gift of gold. Have you ever thought that the magi of all people could echo those words, of thine own have we given thee? The second Adam, the Lord Jesus, leaves prosperity for poverty. He who was rich became poor. There was a TV series some time ago in which millionaires disguised themselves and became carers, volunteers, workers before giving away some of their wealth. If we try this morning within our human limitations to imagine, for example, Richard Branson or Alan Sugar becoming a London vagrant, a man with thousand-pound suits, now dressed in rags. A man accustomed to caviar and salmon, now feeding at a soup kitchen. A man who once rode in the most expensive cars, now walking the streets in soulless shoes. If we imagine the most extreme example that comes to mind, my friends, we have not begun to understand the incredible, phenomenal truth that lies behind the words of Scripture. Though he was rich, yet for your sake, for my sake, he became poor. The throne room of heaven itself is exchanged for a humble home in Nazareth. The worship and service of countless angelic beings is exchanged for a humble mother in Mary. The glory of God's sinless presence is exchanged for a humble birth in a manger. Why? Why would Jesus leave the glory and purity of heaven? Why would Jesus become poor? Why would he be prepared to give up so much? Well, says Paul, for your sake. Jesus did it for men and women and young people. Jesus did it for you and for me. It was not some selfish enterprise. There was no personal gain. Christ did it for the church for the church in the city of Corinth and for the church in the town of New Milton. He did it for his people of every age and generation, of every tongue, tribe, language and nation. He did it for your sake. But why, Lord? Why come from heaven to earth? Why come from glorious riches to humiliating poverty? Our text gives us the reason, shows us the purpose of his poverty. It's here, thirdly, in prosperity, so that you, through his poverty, might become rich. That's why he who was rich became poor, so that you, through his poverty, might become rich. When we think of Christ born in a manger, the humiliation of it, we wonder if there could be even further humiliation, but there is. Again, Paul, writing in Philippians 2, says of Christ that being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. We need to understand that the poverty of Christ was extreme. It was not simply that no room in the inn meant lying in the manger. It was not simply the crudity of the surroundings and the aroma of the animals. It was not simply that he embraced the poverty of Mary and Joseph. God became man. He did not lay down his divinity. There's something called the kenotic theory 
the idea that somehow Christ emptied himself of his deity in order to embrace his humanity. That's not true. Veiled in flesh, the Godhead see, says the carol. Here is one who is both fully God and fully man, two natures in one person. The poverty of Christ was extreme. As Isaiah had foretold, as Christ grew from an infant to a man, he was despised and rejected by men. His appearance was marred beyond that of any man. His crown of glory replaced by a crown of thorns. He experienced the poverty of broken fellowship. My God, my God, he cries, why hast thou forsaken me? He experienced the poverty of death, even death upon a cross. That first Christmas, the angels had announced to the shepherds, I bring you good news of great joy. Good news? What good news? This is the good news, that you, through his poverty, might become rich. The Son of God became man, that men might become the sons of the living God. He who had no sin became sin for us, that in him we might be counted the righteous before God. The sacrifice of Christ means the salvation of the Christian. The poverty of Christ means the prosperity of the Christian. The humility of Christ means the resurrection of the Christian. He who became poor, that we may become rich. It's the most amazing transaction. It's an incredible exchange. It's a wondrous transfer. The second Adam, the Lord Jesus, gives his wealth to the first Adam. Now please understand, despite the language of scripture here, This is not about being rich in the material things of this present world. We utterly reject what is called the prosperity gospel. The idea that if we give of our money to God, that he will bless us abundantly with great wealth. In the providence of God, as we concluded our daily readings in Alistair Begg this morning, it so happened in God's providence that he touched on this very subject. And he says this, We are rightly at pains on the strength of biblical warrant to refute every notion of the prosperity gospel. God is not our personal vending machine. Jesus Christ is not our butler. And the Holy Spirit is not our genie. That sums it up very well, doesn't it? This is not about being rich in material things. It is about being rich in the spiritual things of this world and the next. In other words, rich for eternity. When the poverty of Christ and the work and sacrifice of Christ are applied to you and to me, we, my friends, are rich. We are rich in peace when by nature we are at war with God. We are rich in purpose when by nature we have lost our way. We are rich in hope when by nature we have no hope for the future. We are rich in righteousness when by nature we wear the poverty of sin. We are rich in freedom when by nature we are the captives of Satan. We are rich in light when by nature we are the inhabitants of darkness. We are rich in life when by nature we are spiritually dead. There is here a great challenge for the Christian. You see, Paul wants to test the sincerity of the love of these Christians in Corinth. Let's compare, he says, with the love of others. 
and his immediate comparison is with Christ. The apostle is making a vital point that our giving, that is the Christian's giving in every area of life, our love, our energy, our time, our talent, and yes, our money, is to be compared, not with that of another Christian, but with Christ himself. When we make that comparison, then we must say with Isaac Watts of old, were the whole realm of nature mine, that were an offering far too small, love so amazing, so divine, demands my soul, my life, my all. The gift of Christ is the principle of our Christmas celebration and is to be the pattern of the Christian. The hymn we sang a few minutes ago captures our text. Thou who wast rich beyond all splendor, all for love's sake becamest poor. Thrones for a manger did surrender, sapphire paved courts, the stable floor. Thou who wast rich beyond all splendour, all for love's sake, becamest poor. In our day we're familiar with many high streets and shopping centres where we may find goods to buy and things we want. But there is only one centre, one place, the cross at Calvary where eternal poverty can become eternal prosperity. There is only one person who can take our filthy, sin-soaked garments and clothe us in his perfect righteousness. The sacrifice of Christ did not begin on the cross. It began in the womb and the manger. The sovereign God who became the servant king. The babe of Bethlehem who left the riches of heaven for the poverty of earth. That men and women might leave the poverty of sin for the riches of salvation. Might leave the poverty of the world for the riches of glory. You know, says Paul as he begins our text, you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. So I close, I want to ask you this morning, well, do you? Do you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ? Let me ask you, I know about the presents under the tree and the food in the kitchen and the laughter in the lounge, but in real and lasting terms, is this another Christmas time of poverty for you? Or will you go from this place even today, rich beyond measure, for you have the riches of Christ, for you have received him into your heart and into your life and into your home as Saviour and Lord and friend. He who was rich became poor, that through his poverty we might become rich. The most amazing transfer, the most wondrous transaction. Let's come to God in prayer. Let us pray. You know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. In moment of quietness, we reflect on that statement by the Apostle and would ask in our hearts, in our lives, in the depths of our soul, whether it is true. True for us, personally, individually. Do we truly know the grace of the Lord Jesus? If we recognised our natural poverty, if we recognised his natural wealth, have we discovered that wonderfully he has become poor, 
born in a manger, obedient unto death on a cross, that we who by nature are poor may become rich, rich in salvation, rich in life, life that is abundant, life that is eternal. Oh Lord, we covered every soul here for you, and we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.